this message is very important to God. Um, I'm going to repeat this. I wrote this down this morning, and I'm going to read it to you. It's very, very important. He says, God's chosen ones for the end times are not like the other saints. We are rebels, free spirits, originals, ones that cannot live in a label or a box that is completely organized like a church. Um, we have wings, the span of buildings. We are in deep depression because we were not able to live in the colorful manner which our Father in Heaven created us to live. And so because of our deep depression, we are capable of complete chaos or complete love and surrender. And this is why our Father picked us for this time because He knew we were comparable to the greatness of the evil that was to come in this time. That we were strong enough and our wings were large enough to burst out of the cages that Satan is putting us in. And God says, yes, you are going to ruffle the feathers of the church goers because you are not like them. You are, you are a sinner, but they have yet to learn from you because I do not know them, but I know you. They are going to hate you because you will no longer be able to allow them to live in denial or a lie. Bam. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce and welcome to our next installment of The Woman with the Alabaster Jar. We're going to be looking at Chapter 2, The Bridegroom, today. I will be placing the other parts of this book down in the description box below in case you have missed those first two parts. I'm not going to reiterate today things I've reiterated in those other two parts, meaning that there's probably going to be a lot of information in this book that I don't necessarily agree with, given current findings and current understanding that we actually do have when it comes to Magdalene and Yeshua. So again, if you've missed the first uh, two or three parts of this series, I will place them down in the description box below so that you can catch up with us. Now, with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. In the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem that are now deserted, there shall yet be heard the cry of joy the cry of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride. Jeremiah 3310b through 11a. The theme of the bride and bridegroom permeates the books of the Hebrew prophets like the letimoth of an opera. The voice of the bride and the bridegroom heard in the land is a sign of blessing and joy for the entire community. In the book of the Hebrew prophet Ezekiel, God found his bride while she was yet a child, naked and abandoned. He became her mentor, addressing her, feeding her, and protecting her until she came of age and then marrying her. But she was unfaithful. This is one of the underlying themes of the Hebrew scripture, that God is the faithful bridegroom and that his chosen symbolic bride, the community of the covenant, is unfaithful. That paragraph just made me sick and queasy to my stomach. Y'all, that's grooming. This is why I'm telling you the God of the Bible is Lucifer, not source creator. To use a metaphor like that, that's grooming. I'm going to reread this to you and you guys tell me what you think, but this just made my stomach turn. In the book of the pre Hebrew prophet Ezekiel, God found his bride while she was still yet a child, naked and abandoned. He became her mentor, dressing her, feeding her, and protecting her until she came of age and then marrying her. But she was unfaithful. She was groomed. That's talking about grooming. This is the one underlying theme of the Hebrew scriptures, that God is the faithful bridegroom and that his chosen symbolic bride, the community of the covenant, is unfaithful. The real God doesn't force you, doesn't entrap you, and doesn't groom you. Just saying. The entire book of Hosea dwells on the love of God has for his unfaithful people, reflected in the steadfast and forgiving love Hosea has for his wife, the prostitute Gomer. 
The Hebrew prophet Isaiah prophecies a th time when God will again espouse his people and their land will be healed. As the bridegroom rejoices in her bride, so shall your God rejoice in you. Y'all, if this is not screaming Satanism, I don't know what else to tell you. I, I mean, I just don't even know what else to tell you. This is satanic. This is not about free will choice, which is what God gives us. And there's no bargaining with the real God. You don't have to bargain with him. You don't have to sacrifice for him. That's what you have to do for Lucifer. The evidence is written on these pages. It's in your Bible. The God of the Bible is Lucifer. The theme of the bridegroom and the bride of the sacred marriage recurs often in Hebrew scripture. One familiar but curious passage from the 23rd Psalm attributed to King David is reminiscent of the ancient time when God was identified with the role of the bride. You spread a banquet before you, you anoint my head with oil. This line portrays God as feminine in the rites of the ancient Middle East. The goddess is the bride who anoints her chosen consort, bestowing her favor and kingship on him. She is the great goddess of the Neolithic culture that preceded the Indo-Aryan invasions. Rough dates for the goddess worship civilization of Old Europe and the Near East are 7,000 to 350 BCE. But the goddess was not officially banned in the region until AD 500 when her last temple was fully closed. Then the gracious pillar halls of her earthly abode were abandoned to become haunts of a bird, and the statues of her elegant form were trundled away in carts and smashed to oblivion. So that is true, even though we know King David was no righteous man. King David was a Satanist. It's in the Bible. He did human sacrifice, and he trafficked people. The Heroes Gamus. We have already mentioned that in the Near Eastern religions of Sumar, Babylon, and Canaan, anointing the head of the king with oil was a ritual performed by the heiress or royal priestess who represented the goddess. In Greek, this rite was called Heros Gamus, or sacred marriage. The anointing of the head had an erotic significance, the head being symbolic of the phallus anointed by the woman for penetration during the physical consummation of marriage. The chosen bridegroom was anointed by the royal priestess, the surrogate of the goddess. Songs of love, praise, and thanksgiving accompanied the couple, and following the consummation of their union, a lavish wedding banquet was celebrated in the whole city amid general rejoicing of its citizens. The feast sometimes lasted for days. The blessing of the royal union would be reflected in the continued fertility of crops and herds and well-being of the community. Y'all know Messiah means a phallical pillar, so. Through this union with the priestess and the king consort received royal status. He became the anointed one in Hebrew, the Messiah, the, the, yeah, the, the, okay, yeah, so that's what we talked about earlier. So, yeah, the woman, that's what I said last week. This is all about Magdalene. This has got nothing to do with Yahshua. It's about Magdalene. She was the dominant one. When he married her and was her student and awoken himself, then he became the anointed one, as in her Messiah, her phallical pillar. It's nothing like what the church tells you it is. Nothing. The church inverted everything. The one who was anointed the head of the king and spread a banquet before him, who filled his cup with blessings and was his advocate before his enemies, was in the ancient rites indigenous to the Near East, the great goddess. The sacred union of her royal priestess with her chosen king or consort was celebrated as a source of regeneration, vitality, and harmony for the entire community. The ancient practice was later reflected in the annual fertility rituals of the entire region, often enacted to celebrate the new year. In some of these cults of the Mesopotamian region, the chosen consort of the local temple priestess was ritually sacrificed to ensure the continued fertility of the land. The planting of the sacrificed king was understood to ensure the crops would flourish and the people would prosper. We've talked about this with our, um, our Easter episode. It wasn't a real sacrifice. This is what happened in 
the Ishtar time, Ishtar time with Tammuz and Ishtar. So what Magdalene and Yahshua were doing with their fellow priests and priestesses is they were reenacting the fall of Tammuz to the earth and then resurrecting again into the heavens. So the men, the priests would go into these caves for three days and then three days later they're high priestesses their wives would come to the caves and get them out to reenact this idea of resurrecting again to our highest good there was literally no real sacrifice yashua was not crucified believing believing that yashua was crucified to save you of your sins is like the main law of satanism that's satanic that's what they do on those islands in the caribbean if you know what i mean or up in that park up in san francisco near not san francisco near northern california i cannot say the name of it you guys know what i'm talking about okay actually sacrificing a human being is satanic period end of story wake up if you still think yashua was killed to save you you are practicing Satanism. I know brainwashing is real. I know programming is real. And I know the truth hurts, but that's the truth. And actually the truth will set you free because knowing that, knowing you hold your own salvation within your own hands, which is what Yahshua taught is liberating. And everything these high priests and priests did was all symbolic of each human's resurrection through their own self not through relying on somebody else to do it for you no one's coming to save you and that's your superpower that's not that's not bad news that's good news because if you allow somebody else to save you you allow somebody else to have power and control over you that's real good news that no one is coming to save you because that means that you get the privilege of saving yourself and that's true salvation and that is what yashua taught that is the true teachings of yeshua and magdalene that you save yourself okay with the indo aryan invasion circa 3500 bc came the idea of a supreme male deity whose anger and wrath must be propitiated through the centuries cults based on male god of unlimited power gradually displaced the worship of the bountiful goddess in palestine in the wake of the patriarchal articulation of the unseen god as lord and male prophets took over the ancient role of anointing the king a function that had once been reserved for royal priestess or the great goddess in the 11th century bc the people of israel persuaded their god against his better judgment according to the scriptural accounts to allow them to have a king like that of their pagan neighbors scripture records that yahweh was reluctant to grant their request he had wanted to be the sole ruler of israel yahweh is moloch if you're new to this channel yahweh is moloch it's not who you think it is but he relented and finally gave the prophet Samuel permission to anoint Saul and later David, king of Israel. It should be noted that David married Michal, the daughter of King Saul, according to the ancient tradition of claiming kingship through marriage to a daughter of a royal house. Stop venerating David. Stop it. Stop it. All of these men in the Old Testament are Satanist. It's there in the scripture. You don't need me to tell you that. Read your damn Bible for yourself. Abraham, Jacob, Noah, Moses, Samson, David, Solomon, Isaiah, all Satanist, all of them. Their actions are what tell you they're Satanist. What's a virginal burnt offering, which is how it's called in the Bible, what they, the offering they made God, Yahweh, which is Moloch. What's a virginal burnt offering? Well, a virgin is a child. A burnt offering is fire. For a Yahweh or Moloch, they would kill the baby 
and put it in like a pan over this pyre of a Moloch statue and light it. If you want to worship the God that David and Solomon and Abraham and Jacob worship, then you are worshiping Lucifer. And we are not the same. The God I worship does not demand human sacrifice. Period. End of story. In the centuries that followed, the prerogative anointing the king was given to the priest of the temple of Jerusalem, but it was not always so. It was once the exclusive prerogative of the royal bride. Why do you think that they tr trashed Magdalene's name so much? I've told you guys in my research, I know who her dad was. Magdalene, it's the Magdalene bloodline. I know who her father was. She was the royal bride. It's about the Merovingian, the Magdalene bloodline. With the advent of the supreme male deity who replaced the goddess in the civilizations of the Near East, the role of the king as the surrogate of the deity became the enriched, just as the royal priestess had once represented the great goddess. A poem written about 2100 BC in the Samar refers to Marduk, the ruling deity of Babylon, as the bridegroom of my well-being. The Hebrew poets and prophets adopted this image of God's intimate relationship with his people. And in the Greek New Testament, all four gospels are sprinkled with this bridegroom motif with reference to Jesus, Yahshua. There is a great deal of evidence in the New Testament that Yahshua understood the intimate marriage relationship between God and the covenant community that he himself cons consciously adopted the role of the bridegroom king of the people. It is clear from the Gospels that Yahshua did not come to overthrow Rome's dominion. The Gospel parables include repeated references to the wedding theme, and Yahshua is often represented as the bridegroom. Well, we don't even know if Rome actually existed at this point because of the, all the Tartaria information coming out. I am going to be grabbing my popcorn when the academic world figures this out that we got totally duped on our history so i'm not even sure if rome actually existed so jesus the bridegroom the people of palestine had long awaited the coming of a messiah a phallical penis god's anointed one to save them from the oppression of the roman tyranny in the illegitimate and de depositic ruler of the ca uh, capricious herodian rulers but y'all, okay, Margaret Starbird, do you actually know what the Jewish prophecy stated? Because that's not what the Jewish prophecy stated. Y'all, y'all, look up the, the real Jewish prophecy. The church changed it because any, listen, that's in the narcissistic, psychopathic handbook. Like you got to rewrite the past to fit your narrative. And that's what the church did. The real, the real Jewish prophecy said that there would be two teachers that would come to two, not one. The Christian church, church changed that and said there would be one teacher who would come again a second time. That's not what the prophecy, prophecy said. So when people ask if Yahshua and Magdalene are back, no, they're not back right now. That's not what the prophecy said. And my channelings with Magdalene, this is not their karma. They can't come back because they're not here to save you. You have to save yourself. That's what they taught was saving yourself. So why would they come back? They're not here yet. They're not going to come back until maybe we've ascended. Maybe. I don't know. But that this isn't their karma. It's our karma. And again, the original Jewish prophecy said there would be two teachers. The church changed it and said there would be one and he would come back again. You see what they're doing? Okay. Okay. The hope of many Jews was that a dev devonic Messiah would come with the power to cut down the enemies of Israel. Their prophet had foretold it. The purest religious community at Qumran and the politically radical zealots lived in daily expectation that these prophecies would be fulfilled. Sounds like what we're living through right now, actually. This does not sound like the history. It sounds like she's talking about us right now. Because these the Jewish people would have known the true prophecy would have been two teachers would come. But that actually sounds like what's happening now, that a lot of people are just sitting around waiting for Jesus to come back to take care of the problem for us. Like a spoiled child. You have to take care of this problem yourself. We all have to. That's why we're here on earth. 
after the death of Yahshua, which um, he wasn't crucified, interpretations of the word of the prophets shifted away from a worldly kingdom, which had been their hope, to a postponed heavenly kingdom in an age to come. The suffering servant, images of Isaiah, the metaphor of the obedient lamb of a sacrifice who would return in glory to save the oppressed became the prevalent myth of the Christian movement in the later half of the first century and ever after. But Jesus himself seems to have understood his role as that of the representation of Yahweh. No, no. Well, Jesus, I mean, Jesus means like hell Satan. So that, that wasn't his name. His name was Yahshua. And he was not a representation of Yahweh. If you are in a church or a religion that says that there's one leader who represents God on earth, honey, you're in a cult. You're in a cult. You're in a destructive cult. Every single one of us is a prophet. All of us have the ability to talk to God. That is what Yahshua taught you and Magdalene taught you. If you want to go to a spiritual advisor, like, you know, a tarot card reader or a tea leaf reader or a Reiki, awesome. But they're not your leaders. They're there to help you. You figure out your shit yourself. And Yahweh is Moloch. As the heavenly bridegroom of Israel, the anointed king and faithful son, he is sacrificed for the sake of community, just like a good Satanist. Y'all. I don't know what else to say. The God, the true God, the true source God does not demand human sacrifice. He's not bloodthirsty. Lucifer is. If you're going to a church and you're worship, worshiping a crucified human, you're in a satanic religion. There's no two ways about this. You are in a satanic religion. The God of the church is Yahweh. But Yahweh is Moloch. Do your research. Stop giving your power over. The evangelist Mark carefully set the stage for this revelation of Jesus as the bridegroom king, king of Israel. He recounts the arrival of Jesus in the environs of Jerusalem prior to the Passover. As they approached Jerusalem, Jesus sent his two disciples ahead to Bethany to procure a clot with no one has ever written. They threw their cloaks over their colt. A cult, sorry, I misread that. A cult that no one has ever written. And Jesus rode upon its back to Jerusalem. The people spread out their cloaks and branches along the way and proclaimed the coming king of our father, David. All satanic. This event fulfilled the Masonic prophecy found in the book of Hebrew, the prophet Zechariah. Jesus did not just accidentally participate in this. His writing on the cult was a conscious symbolic action by which he deliberately and irrevocably proclaimed his Masonic role all satanic and all made up so again you guys we don't have the real bible none of us do all we have is king james bible and everything that's not the king james bible is an offshoot of the king james bible king james made this shit up he was a satanist you can find this information out it's out there if i can find it you can find it the Bible you have is not the real Bible. It's the satanic Bible. The real Bible is underneath the fucking Vatican. None of us have seen it. I've only been able to get my hands on some missing books of the Bible that tell a very different story. Use your logic. Use your critical thinking skills. We know the government's corrupt. We know medicine's corrupt. We know education's corrupt. We know politics is corrupt. Why the hell would you ever think the church isn't corrupt? Of course it is. It's more corrupt than any of these other institutions. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. In the time of the books of Genesis and Chronicles, it was customary for the charismatic leader, ding, 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 red flag for a cult, charismatic leader, who came in peace to come riding on a donkey, whereas a warrior king rode a war horse and came bearing arms. King David arranges for his son Solomon to ride his royal donkey to the anointing as the king of Israel. And y'all know, we've talked about it, the only reason why Solomon became the king after David is because out of all of David's sons, Solomon was the only one that was continuing to commit sacrifices in the temple. 
all of his other sons walked away and said, yeah, no, we're not comfortable with this. But yet we venerate Solomon because Solomon was a good little Satanist. The church has played you. You've been played. Take your power back. Take your, use your critical thinking skills. Do you want to worship a God that demands human sacrifice? I don't. Mark's Jesus proclaims his missions as a king of peace by riding the colt of a donkey on his entry into to Jerusalem. But he was at the same time claiming to be the heir of David. An action of tremendous political significance. He was proclaiming the fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecies. Your king will make peace among the nations and he will rule from sea to sea. Y'all again, the 12 tribes of Israel coming from Jacob are the controller families. They're not the good guys. Everything's inverted. The real tribes of Israel, the good tribes of Israel are galactic. Yahshua came from the Lyran group, the lion, the Lyrans, not through the line of David. But that's what the controllers want you to believe because they want you to venerate them. The woman with the alabaster jar. Bethany is a small village located on the southeastern spur of the Mount of Olives. In Zechariah 14, we find the apocalyptic expectation that when the Lord comes to save Israel from her foes, he will come to the Mount of Olives. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. This prophecy elevated the Mount of Olives to a site of messianic expectation. It was to Bethany on the Mount of Olives that Yahshua returned every evening after visiting Jerusalem during the week of Passover. And it was on this mount that he was anointed by the woman with the alabaster jar. But remember, Yahshua was not Jewish. He was Egyptian. He would not have been celebrating Passover. Of course, he did have Jewish students who would have been celebrating Passover, but he himself would not have been celebrating Passover. He would have been celebrating the Tammuz and Ishtar of the Egyptians and the Sumerians, not Passover. The story of the anointing of Yahshua by the woman in Bethany is one of the most important events recorded in the New Testament Gospels. It must be extremely significant, for it is a rare event indeed that it was reported in all four canonical Gospels. The story of the anointing is easily the most intimate expression of Eros, relentlessness, in the recorded events of Yahshua's life. And for that reason alone, it deserves careful scrutiny. Yet it has rarely received the recognition it deserves. What was the meaning of the action of this woman at Bethany? And isn't it likely that the woman who anointed Yahshua at the banquet at Bethany was the same woman who encountered him in the garden near the tomb at dawn on Easter morning? Yes, because it was his wife, Magdalene. Because that, like, I want to really give Margaret Starbird a bit of a break because I knew, she, I know she wrote this book when there was so little information truly truly available but because of all the information that we have available now half of this book is bunk it's just not true she's going off of so margaret starbert in this book is going off of the idea that the bible is true it's been edited like 55 times if it's the word of god why would it need to be edited like 55 times and um why would they hide the geneva bible if if there was nothing to hide in the king james version i'm just saying it. common sense here common sense ain't so common especially when it comes to religious indoctrination but this is just all common sense right one evening according to mark 14 3 while jesus was in beth bethany Reclining at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar. The action of the woman at Bethany can be understood as a prophetic recogni recognition of Jesus as the Messiah, the anointed one. An action construed as politically dangerous because it proclaimed the kingship of Yahshua. Yahshua had kingship because he was married to Magdalene. That's why he had kingship. Because he was married to Magdalene. She was the royal bride. In ancient Israel, kings, priests, and prophets were anointed with oil to receive their authority as the chosen to represent Yahweh. Well, maybe in Israel, but not in Tartaria. Because Yahweh satanic, that's Moloch. 
The sacred olive oil was carefully prepared by the priest in the temple and mixed according to a prescribed recipe with other spices, cinnamon, myrrh, sweet calamus, and cassia. It, it, its secular use was prohibited on pain of excommunication. What? Any organ is red flag number two. So we have a charismatic leader and now we have a pain of excommunication. That's red flag number two. That means that this is a cult. They're talking about a, the priest of Yahweh being a cult, which we know the, the Christian church is a cult. It's a destructive cult because Lucifer is the God of destruction and chaos. So of course it's a destructive cult. But the woman of Bethany did not use the sacred oil of the temple priest. She opened an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured it on his head. Pure nard is believed by current scholarship to be a possible corruption of the Greek word for spike nard. The aromatic ugent was a very rare and expensive perfume from a plant that grew in India. In Hellenized Palestine, wealthy women sometimes wore a small amount of this ugent in an alabaster vital or alabastron on a chain around their neck. It was often a dowry item and it was custom to break the flask, anointing the bottom body of the beloved deceased with its contents and then to leave the fragments of the jar in the tomb. In addition to the accounts of the gospels that describe the anointing of Jesus with this expensive perfume, there is one other place in scripture where spike nard is mentioned. For the king's banquet, my nard giveth forth its fragrance. Song of Songs 112. It is the bride whose fra fragrant spike nard spreads among the bridegroom king at his banquet in the Song of Songs, the ancient song of marriages. And that actually makes sense to me because I know that Magdalene spent time in India, as did her mother. They studied there, as did Yahshua. So that makes sense so for all the Christians out there that think yoga is demonic. LOL, you're the one practicing a demonic faith, faith not the yoga people. It's you. You're in a satanic church, not the yoga people. The Song of Songs. Modern research into the origins and meaning of the Song of Songs illuminates the gospel anointing of Jesus. It is believed that the song was originally a liturgical lit litmacy for performance during rites of the sacred marriage. It is very similar to the love poetry of the ancient fertility religions practiced in Sumnar canon in Egypt. The Song of Songs was widely popular in Palestine during the time of Christ. Two fragments of the songs were found in Cave 4 of the monastic community near Qumran. This attests to its popularity in the 1st century among the community that hid the Dead Sea Scrolls. A Greek translation of the songs dates to 100 BC. A noted Jewish scholar and teacher, Rabbi Aquibia, who died in AD 135, is quoted as saying, the whole world is not worth the day on which the Song of Songs was given to Israel, for all scriptures are holy, but the Song of Songs is the holy of holies. The same rabbi objected to the widespread singing of the songs in the streets and banquet halls, so popular was it in Palestine during this time. The Song of Songs was considered holy and approved by Jewish rabbis because it was interpreted allegorically as the betrayal of Yahweh's love for his bride, the people of Israel. Yahweh's love for his groomed child that's going to be sacrificed. If it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a fucking duck. It is possible that the rabbi retained the song as a sacred book because they believed it was composed by King Solomon. For whatever reason, it seemed to have been common domain in the first century Jerusalem. The Song and the Cult of the Bridegroom Some modern scholars believe that the Song of Songs was composed as part of the Sumerian fertility rites of Ishtar and T Tammuz, whose myth had been current in the ancient Near East for several thousand years. Love poetry inscribed on recently deciphered cuneiform tablets described Tammuz as a shepherd and a faithful son. Yes. Things that were later applied to Yahshua. Yeah, we talked about that. I'll put that episode down below if you missed it, where we talked about Ash Wednesday and all that kind of stuff. The beloved of Tammuz is referred to as the sister and bride. The king was considered a chosen son by virtue of the fact that the deity had formed him in his mother's womb. It's about the women. It's about Magdalene. 
He was anointed for his role, which included his ritual death and burial. It was the duty of the king to be united with goddess Mother Earth, Ishtar. After marriage, Tamun was ritually tortured, killed, and buried, ensuring regeneration of the crops and herds. The king could not be allowed to become old or weak or to lose his strength and vitality, for the life of the people was a reflection of his vir vir virility. If his power and strength were to ebb, so would theirs. This is all metaphor. We've talked about this so many times, so many times, guys. It's all fucking metaphor. But of course, the Satanists actually sacrifice people. It's all metaphor. Yahshua wasn't crucified. And if you want so badly for Yahshua to have been crucified, then maybe that's a sign to you that you're, you actually are a Satanist, right? Like maybe that's... Maybe that's your religion, is Satanism. Because when I realized he wasn't crucified, it was liberation. I was just so joyous to realize that. In some rites, the tortured king was entombed when the resurrected after a brief period, period, normally three days. The poetry from the liturgy includes the laminations of Ishtar over the death of Tammuz, the goddess search for the missing god, and the expression of joy at his return. The portion of this prevailing bridegroom myth of the pagan cults is reenacted in the Gospel of John when Magdalene encounters the risen Yahshua near the tomb on Ishtar because they were married and that was her job. They were reenacting it. He wasn't dead. He was just hanging out in there for three days with all the other priests, with all the other messiahs. And the girls came and got them. And that was the celebration of the resurrection from humanity from this low density earth up back into the cosmos. It's once you see it, you can't unsee it. It makes so much. The truth makes way more sense. It makes way more sense than the bullshit they fed us at church. And it is made a visual in the pieces in the painting of the disposition, the removal of Yahshua from the cross in Christian art, satanic art. The cult of the dead and the resurrection of Tammuz spread to Palestine along with the epifeast of the shepherd and anointed. Tammuz was the ancient prototype of the bridegroom. As we have mentioned, the more ancient practices in the Near East was that of the matrilineal royal priestess conferring kingship on her consort, since marriage to the representative of the goddess was essential for such status. Again, it's about Magdalene. Yahshua was not considered a king until he married Magdalene. These rites of the vegetation and fertility gods and goddesses were well known in ancient Israel. In Ezekiel 8.14, for example, the prophet is shown a group of Hebrew women crying over Tammuz, the Babylonian fertility de deity who is identified with Dumuzi or Tammuz. This was understood by the prophet to be an abomination. In fact, Israel's prophet had long laminated the fact that the people were unfaithful to Yahweh, their male deity. Yeah, because the Khazarian mafia worships Yahweh. And so they were pissed off. So just invert everything, guys. Everything that the Bible says is good is bad, and everything the Bible says is bad is good. So the mafia, the Khazarian mafia, was upset that people were actually understanding the true ascension of the human soul, and they wanted the people solely worshiping Yahweh, their God. Continually, it served the unfaithful community returned to the pagan worship of Asherah and Baal and the local counterparts of the Babylonian Ishtar and Tammuz. In the words of their prophets, these people were whoring after false gods. During the period of Greek influence and into the period of the Roman Empire, the rites of other sacrificed sun gods and earth or moon goddesses became modified, borrowed, and confused with neighboring practices. Lines that are identical and parallel to those in the Song of Songs are found in the liturgical pro uh, poem from the cult of the Egyptian goddess Isis, the sister bride of the mutilated sun god Osiris. Ancient carvings of Osiris, uh, <laughs> ancient carvings of Isis laminating over the corpse of Osiris provided a model for the medieval pietists. Various the theories are available on the origins of the low poetry of the sacred marriage, but it is clear that the rites of the dying and the rising fertility god were current in Palestine at the time of Yahshua. And yes, Isis and Osiris were good. Any truthers telling you that they are bad are either very mistaken and have not done their research, or they are infiltrators. And 
ISIS back then was spelled E-S-S-E, the Essenes. Yeshua and Magdalene were of the priest and priesthood of ISIS. They were Essenes. The shepherd king and his bride. It may be impossible to de determine the exact source of the biblical song of songs, but its meaning is obvious. It is the wedding song of the shepherd king and his bride. The rites of the heroes Gamus were so well known in the Hellenized world that the anointing of the head of Jesus could not have been misunderstood by those who witnessed it. The author of Mark's gospel is a master at attributing mythic importance to certain events, calming the storm, cleansing the temple, and other stories in his gospel proclaim the mythic identity of Yahshua through action. The story of his anointing by the woman at Bethany is no exception. It is clear from Yahshua's response to the anointing that he understood and accepted it, and that he also accepted his mythic role as a sacrifice by bridegroom that he was going to reenact and not actually do. Like, not actually be killed. Like, reenact. Every year they did this. This is so much as a one time thing, guys. Just like we do Christmas every year, just like we do Easter every year, they did this every year. Throughout the Greek Bible, we encounter references to the Masonic wedding feasts and references to Yahshua as the bridegroom are found throughout the Gospels. Numerous references to the bridegroom and the bridal chamber also appear in the Gnostic Gospels discovered at the Nag Hammadi in Egypt in 1945, a fact that attests to the prevalence of this theme among some sects of early Christians. In Mark 2, 19 through 20, Yahshua refers to the fact that his uh, disciples are not fasting. When the bridegroom is taken away from them, on that day they will fast. This passage is echoed in Mark 14. When the disciples complain about the cost of the wasted perfume, Yahshua defends the one saying, The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. I think that must have been added in there by the Satanists because that is a very narcissistic, psychopathic thing to say. And I don't think Yahshua said that at all. And then he announces that a woman has anointed his body for burial, confirming the proclamation she has given of the sacred marriage, which includes the torture and death of the anointed bridegroom king, a reenactment of Tammuz and Ishtar, not a real thing. These frequent allusions to Yahshua as the bridegroom of the fertility myth could be the creation of the, of the Hellenized authors of the Gospels, but it's far more likely that they originated with Yahshua himself in the tradition of the Hebrew prophets who had proclaimed Yahweh as the heavenly bridegroom of the community and the king of Israel as his faithful son or servant, the anointed Messiah. The theme of the bridegroom as a faithful son terms also Terms found also, as noted in Sumerian and Canaanite mythologies, are repeated in the Apocalypse, Apocalypse of John, the final book of the Greek New Testament, which was written by a Jewish author at the close of the first century AD. Judas and the Zealots. Perhaps the most powerful evidence that the anointing was immediately understood by those at the banquet at Bethany was the action reported to have been taken by Judas. Some modern scholars portrayed Judas as a zealot, a right-wing political extremist who is hoping for the overthrow of the Roman rule. It is considered likely that Judas was a member of the militant Zionistic group called Sicari, the Sons of the Dagger. He must have been totally disillusioned when he realized that the heir of David did not intend to overthrow the Roman dominion in Judea. Jesus had chosen the role of the bridegroom, and the reign of God was being proclaimed as a universal wedding banquet open to all. For this reason, Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest to betray Jesus. Nope. Jordan Maxwell did a really good talk about this a long time ago. Yeshua and Magdalene were famous. Everybody knows what Tom Cruise looks like, right? Everybody watching knows what he looks like. So if you were going to go like tell on Tom Cruise, his location, you know how Judas kisses Jesus, gives him the kiss of death to point to the authorities who he is. That wouldn't have to happen. They would already know who he is. Just like if it was Tom Cruise, you would know what Tom Cruise, he was famous. You knew what he looked like. So the whole Judas story is nothing but propaganda. There's no truth to it whatsoever. And in the gospel of Judas, I actually really enjoy the gospel of, of Judas because the gospel of Judas was like a, a political opinion piece where basically he was saying the churches are turning satanic. 
I mean, he basically, no wonder it was banned from the Bible. He was like, all you fools are going to end up worshiping Satan. They're going to take this person's teachings and they're going to twist them. And you're going to end up worshiping Satan. It is very possible that the anointing convinced him that Jesus was not the Messiah of his expectations. The day of Yahweh had come. The chosen one had been anointed on the Mount of Olives, but not with the sacred oil of Hebrew ritual. He had been anointed with the perfumed ugent of a woman. And he had not only accepted this anointing, but had defended the woman's actions as a prophetic proclamation of his death and burial, just as in the ancient pagan rites of the Hermos Gamus. It was Jude, if Judas was a fundamentalist zealot, zealous for the law, he would have been appalled to see Jesus willingly assume the role of the sacrificed pagan fertility sun god. Obviously, the gospel version of this story was written for Christian converts who would have understood fully the mythological content of the sacred god theme. The pagan rites were practiced in the temples in the ancient cities of the Roman Empire until the newly victorious Christian hierarchy banned them at the end of the 4th century AD. But the early story of the anointing at Bethany was included in all four Gospels, indicating the eyewitness who first told the story must have seen something they considered extremely important. In memory of her. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, whenever someone wanted to proclaim Jesus the Son of God or the Messiah, he always abonished them not to tell anyone about his identity. Yet suddenly in Mark 14, 9, he tells his disciples that the story of the woman with the alabaster jar would be told and retold in memory of her. Someone, perhaps Yahshua himself, must have thought this event was so significant that it should be kept alive in the community. Why? Dennis de Rogmont suggests that when an important event is too dangerous to be discussed, it is formed as a myth and told as a story. In his opinion, from his book, Love in the Western World, first published in French in 1940, could be applied to the entire myth surrounding the lady with the alabaster jar. Was the story of the anointing marriage rite of Jesus told as a myth because of the dangers to the woman who was his wife? Was it considered safer to tell the story knowing that the people who heard it would understand the woman's intimate relationship to the bridegroom king? This kind of has a bit of that emerald tablet's feel to it where in the first verse of the emerald tablets thought says that i'm writing this for you reading it now like for our timeline like maybe it's maybe yashua and magdalene knew that after the a thousand years of peace after tartaria when we entered in gog and magog the story would be completely destroyed and inverted and it would be up to a few of us to actually figure it out the truth which is everybody watching right now that kind of gave me some some chills We are talking here of an oral version of the story, which presumably circulated throughout the Roman Empire for nearly 40 years before the author of Mark's gospel ever wrote it down. In fact, this event was so important that it survived in several different versions in oral tradition. And yet, while it should have been considered scandalous for a woman, any woman, to touch a Jewish man in public, there is barely a hint that the friends of Yahshua were scandalized by this woman's actions because Yahshua wasn't Jewish. Yahshua and Magdalene were Egyptian. They were Atlantean. Their main concern seems to have been for the immense cost of the wasted perfume, valued at a year's wages, as if it had been their personal loss. And who was the woman with the alabaster jar who had not anointed Yahshua? For centuries, she has been portrayed by the church as both a sinner and prostitute, never bride. Yet the church patriarch, Origen, recognized the Magdalene as the sister bride from the Canonicals as did the communities of early Christians living within the Roman Empire of the first century. And the author of John's Gospel calls this woman Mary, the sister of Lazarus. Nope, 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 nope. We talked about this last week. Margaret Starbird, if you're watching, please, honey, please read the Acts of Philip. Because I'm not, I don't sound mean, but it kind of sounds a little idiotic. Like in the Acts of Philip, it's very clear that that Lazarus' sister is Mar Mary of Bethany or Bethany. They are not the same women. Magdalene was not married to Philip and Yahshua. Bethany was married to Philip. That's Lazarus' sister. Magdalene was married to Yahshua. They're two different women. Hun, darling, bless your heart. They're two different women. Don't believe the church propaganda. The church has lied to us. 
you know, it's kind of like, I want to say it this way. Like if you have a, a girlfriend or a guy friend who's dating a girl, if you have a friend who's in a toxic relationship with somebody who's constantly lying to them, like, don't you want to like shake your friend and be like, your partner is a liar. Like get out. How, or why are you believing them? It's the same thing with the church. Like the church has lied to you so many times. They've lost all credibility, all credibility. I don't take what the church says seriously at all. I see what they're saying. And then I laugh because the evidence to, to contradict what they're saying is out there. If somebody has the reputation of being a pathological liar, do not believe them. The church has a reputation for being a pathological liar. Do not take what they say seriously. There's a very strong Roman Catholic tradition that the Apostle John was the protector of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Um, her name was Alma Mari. And, and that after the crucifixion, pers presumably for the safety's sake, he took her to live in Euphias. Listen, he wasn't crucified. We have to we have to let that go. That's satanic. He was not crucified. And again, if that pisses you off, if you think you need to kill someone in order to save yourself, then honey, you are following a satanic religion. The Gospel of John, if not written by John himself, was all likelihood written by one of his own disciples in Euphias. There's evidence in the Gospel of some important historical material about Jesus that is not included in the other three Gospels. Surely God, surely John, and the mother of Yahshua were the source of that material. Nope! <laughs> Margaret, no, they weren't. King James was. Girl, girl, Margaret. Girl, that imp listen, you're obviously a researcher. Research this. Honey, girl, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John were written by King James. Not by Alma Mari or any of Yahshua's students. Honey, they were written by King James. As in the King James Bible, he made it up, girl. The whole thing is made up by him. The real stories in the Geneva Bible and the real Geneva Bible, we can't see. They won't let us see it. Honey, King James made it up. It's a fairy tale. A propaganda fairy tale because they're trying to manipulate you into being Satanist. Girl. That makes me kind of sad that you missed that. That's kind of big. And all that information's out there, guys. Like, I found it. I did a whole video on it. It's all out there. Like, just, just research. King James wasn't hiding the fact that he was a Satanist. Like, he was a proud Satanist. He was out loud and proud about it. And, like, he talks about how he was a master Mason. I mean, he's still in the Masonic website. And he talks about how the Master Masons, the Freemasons, helped him write the Bible, create the Bible. So, all the evidence is out there. And although it was not recorded in the earlier Gospels, the Apostle John and Mary, the mother of Jesus, Alma Mari, that was her name, would also most surely have known the name of the woman who anointed Yahshua. She was Mary of Bethany as lost bride. No, Margaret. Oh, my God. I don't even know, Margaret, if you're still alive. But if anybody knows who Margaret Starbird is, please have her contact me. I will send her a, a copy of the gospel, the Acts of Philip. I will send it to her. Mary of Bethany. And this is why, y'all, y'all, listen. This is why. This is why King James made every woman's name in the New Testament be Mary. It was derogatory. It was like a Jane Doe name. And he wanted to confuse people. Why? Because who are they hiding? Who's the hidden superstar here? Magdalene. They were hiding Magdalene. And so they're getting you all confused. All of these, you don't, you seriously, I mean, you seriously think back in those days, people were so uncreative that they just named their kids all the same name? No. Think about our society today. Yes, there are popular names, but there's many names. The likelihood of that many women being in 
Yahshua's story with the name of Miriam or Mary is very unlikely. And Mary was a derogatory name. His mother's name was Alma Mari. His wife's name was Magdalene. I'm assuming that Philip's wife was just Bethany. Because we know that Magdala was not where Magdalene was from. In fact, Magdala did not even exist when she was alive. That was her literal name. She was the Magdalene. It came through her mother's line. I mean, it makes me really sad that there are researchers out there that are just falling hook, line, and sinker for this false information, fake news. And I want to give a little bit of a, like a, like a, you know, you know, oh, she wrote this a while ago and maybe she just didn't like understand like we do now. Maybe it wasn't time yet for people to really understand the, the real truth that the church is satanic and that Yahweh is Moloch, even though the truth has always been right in front of us, like even though it's in the Bible that they're doing human sacrifices and trafficking women, like it's there, it's in the Bible, we just ignored it. I mean, I'm gonna be honest with you guys, when I was a little kid, like vacation, I remember being at a big event with my church, vacation Bible school, it was hot outside, it's hot outside all the time here. And I remember them, we have us having to sing sing the song father abraham had many sons many sons had father abraham and i remember learning about abraham and not liking him like as a child i remember my reaction was oh like this guy seems like a creep i i did not like him he scared me looking back at that now from my intuitive child spidey senses i guess i knew there was a reason why i didn't like him he was a satanist and my parents had me go into a church that was promoting Satanism, as all churches do. And as soon as the people realize this and wake up from their mind, mind programming, the church will fall apart. And that is the one thing that the cabal is holding on to is the control it has through religion. As long as there's still religion going on, we're going to be under the control of the cabal. That's just the truth of it. Because we're consenting, right? Keep going to church every Sunday. You're consenting to the cabal. Stop going to church. Stop giving the church your money. Start speaking the truth instead of worshiping the lies. Start taking care of yourself, doing your own work, understanding no one's coming to save you and you have the privilege of saving yourself. Then maybe we'll see the timeline flip. This message is very important to God. Um, I'm going to repeat this. I wrote this down this morning and I'm going to read it to you. It's very, very important. He says, God's chosen ones for the end times are not like the other saints. We are rebels, free spirits, originals, ones that cannot live in a label or a box that is completely organized like a church. Um, we have wings, the span of buildings. We are in deep depression because we were not able to live in the colorful manner which our Father in Heaven created us to live. And so, because of our deep depression, we are capable of complete chaos or complete love and surrender. And this is why our Father picked us for this time, because He knew we were comparable to the greatness of the evil that was to come in this time that we were strong enough and our wings were large enough to burst out of the cages that Satan is putting us in. And God says, yes, you are going to ruffle the feathers of the church goers because you are not like them. You are, you are a sinner, but they have yet to learn from you because I do not know them, but I know you. They are going to hate you because you will no longer be able to allow them to live in denial or a lie. Bam. <laughs>